So we have with us uh, senior journalist Mr. Sainath, who has kind of brought the entire issue of agrarian rural India onto the agenda, so to speak. Mr. Sainath, how do you see the upcoming elections? You know, uh, I think there has been a major shift in the character of Indian elections from 2009. It was building before 2009. I say this on the basis that I have at some level covered every general election since 1980 when I was a trainee in UNI. Elections were incredible fun for a reporter and sometimes they still can be. But I would say till 2009, the Indian elections where could be characterized as a gigantic political exercise and engagement. From 2000, the 2009 and 2014 elections, I see a shift in these terms that what was a tremendous, gigantic political exercise has increasingly become and is a managerial exercise. You know, there was, up to 2009, I would say, you could have some oddball candidate, agricultural laborer or trade union worker, yeah, stand against one of the wealthiest industrialists and defeat him. Can still happen, but the chances, I would say, are 99% less than they were, say, in 1972, in, say, South Mumbai, the South Mumbai constituency, Nawal Tata was a candidate. Nawal Tata, the news, if you look at the newspapers of that time, there was no coverage of an election. It was, uh, what would be the margin? Would it be two lakhs in those days? Two lakhs would have been a gigantic margin, etc. And his um, adversary, his main opponent, was an unknown Congress in Tuck trade union leader, I can't remember his name, not heard of before, not heard of since. Yeah, he beat the pants of Naval Tata. Hmm. So I'm saying that, that space, yeah. you know, like even say a George Fernandez in his trade union avatar. Some, some. Some, yeah. They could beat these people. That is now incredibly more difficult. <laughs> because, because money in elections? Or? Money is huge. Money is huge. Look at, look at, for instance, take the uh, character of your parliament. In 2004, you introduced the self-declaration of worth affidavit. Even allowing for the extreme modesty that besets people when declaring their own worth, the ADR, Association for Democratic Reforms, um, their data shows that in 2004, 32% of those elected to the 543 seats of the Lok Sabha were self-declared karodhpatis. In 2009, that was 53%. In 2014, it was 82%. On that growth rate, you must have 120% or something in the coming election. So money is one huge thing. Uh, second is the entire management of media mm -hmm. and communication. You yeah. broke the entire paid news phenomenon. Yeah. 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 And uh, I would say that what the newspapers and magazines have done is to find more sophisticated ways or other loopholes to do more of the same in a way, you know, and that continues in a very big way. And now you've got, you're living in the WhatsApp world and uh, Social media. So 2014 was an election that in a way shocked us all, despite our predictions that it might go that way. Uh, 2019 is being, is being seen by a whole host of Indians as a do or die, a now or never election, where agenda should be set of a certain see, kind. One, one, How do you see that? Yeah, well, one thing about 2014, which I have consistently maintained, and again, I'm saying this is a managerial thing. In 2014, for the first time in your history, a single party majority was achieved on 31%. I do not believe it happened on less than 43% before that. Now, 
a 31% getting you a majority, that's part of a managerial exercise. Okay? How you put play different political actors, how you put up fifth party, fourth party candidates in a place. How you nullify the Muslim vote completely um, so that in Muslim majority seats, in fact, everywhere the BJP is well. Yeah. Yeah. So, that yes, that's, that's a pretty strong uh, example of what's happened. So that managerial exercise, that has been tremendous. Now in 2000, and, and therefore, uh, arithmetic has become incredibly important. Now, the second set of things about Indian elections, which have been consistent across time, is that there are the issues of a village or a town or a city or a constituency. Yeah. The people of the constituency know those issues. They will tell it to you. And then our reporters go back and our TV guys especially go back and write, it's all about Bijli, Sadak and Pani. The problem is that while voters will honestly identify for you what are the important issues of their constituency or their group of people, they may vote on a different set of factors. I may be a displaced or dispossessed farmer in UP, thrown out for some express highway and all that. And those are the most important things in the world. And I may vote for the Ram Mandir. Okay. I'm saying that how the voting intent aligns with the, the, with the issues as perceived by the voters themselves, that has many, many nuances and tricks and pitfalls to it. I also see that in the issues themselves, there are always a set of six, seven issues or concerns. And the weightage of these can change from election to election. Now, Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. The entire electorate was shocked and it was almost like a protest vote that this could be done to our prime minister. And there was also the strength in the government at that moment that that happened. So when sometimes there's an overarching, overriding issue, all other things fall flat. That, that can happen. Sub so caste can be a very major factor in some constituencies, less important in other constituencies where huge issues are, you know, like for, I mean, I'm saying in the constituencies where Forest Rights Act is a life and death matter for a lot of Adivasis. So they may well, their, their voting intent may well align perfectly with the issues but it also may not. So this is the dicey thing about Indian elections, how that, how that can change. There are regional factors, there are caste factors, there are religious factors, and all of them have a particular weightage. Sometimes the weightage of one or two things goes up dramatically. Now, I think that also beginning, as you know, from uh, 89, but picking up tremendous traction in 2013-14 is the communalization issue. Yeah? yeah? And there is also the kind of an unbelievable debasement of discourse. Nobody knows how to handle it, including those who pioneered it. Yeah? They know how to whip it up. They don't know how to get the genie back in the bottle because they're not, they're not thinking that far of where this will lead to. So the kind of hatred, the kind of abuse, I mean, it's made the, it's made the election uh, issues, the main issues, it obscures them. Now, if you watch a typical panel discussion on television, which you shouldn't really, but if you do, you're looking at a, a format that thinks that issues are what the BJP says and what the Congress rebuts it at. And this is, this is a discussion. And that's a spectrum of opinion with maybe two other people from a couple of parties shouting on the sidelines. And with the BJP, with the BJP participant 
having the freedom to heckle every other person in the panel. You have a new component after 2014, which is the RSS ideologue on every panel. Well, actually you have three RSS people on every panel. One is called independent until that can facade, like that Raghav guy or whoever. That facade can no longer be maintained, even with what's this um, uh, comes every Nigam. He was first called independent analyst. He was then called some sympathetic to RSS. Now he's the spokesperson of the BJP. So it's but there's one of that. Then there will be someone from some magazine or Jan Morcha or Jan Mukta, whatever Mukti, whatever it is, who will also be RSS. And then there is the official BJP spokesperson. So there are all panels are packed with at least two to three representatives of the ruling elite. So that's that's another thing. The fourth is the changes, gigantic changes in ownership and structure of the media. Okay. Now the paid news thing was all scandal was already pointing us to this. Hmm. And it also points to the collapse of the advertisement revenue model. Something a journalist like, an essayist like A.J. Liebling pred predicted in 1969 in the New Yorker. He said, you know, you're having a, you're having, you've created a system of revenue where the hosiery manufacturers of New Jersey are going to determine American foreign policy. Okay, so that's what you're going to cover. What, what uh, the richest man in the country is also the own, biggest owner of media in the country. You know, many of the things we see, ETV Kannada, ETV Marathi, they're not owned by Inadu TV, they're owned by Mukesh Ambani or a company that's fronted by him, right? So that's one thing. I think that never in our history have the media been so narrow, so sectarian, so elitist. That also makes a major change in the nature of elections. Lastly, I think, who's running your country? I believe, I've been saying this for many years now, that India is today run by a coalition of socio-religious fundamentalists yeah, and economic market fundamentalists, and many of them are both. And Arun Jaitley, for instance, exemplifies both, the worst of both, but he does. In that situation, there is going to be a debasement of everything. Truth doesn't matter. What, according to you, should be the issues this election? You, I mean, you travel probably more than most of us across India. That Bombay, Delhi, Wallas don't see. See, I think I think many of the different pressing problems that you're looking at, which is unemployment wages, uh, mass, massive migrations, distressed suicides, indebtedness. These are huge issues in Indian society. At any time, they're large issues. But they are gigantic and fall under one rubric, which is the cynically constructed inequality of the last 25 years. I would say that that is the number one issue in the world. Okay. The new liberal, yeah. entire new liberal shift. And I'm, I'm saying that that inequality feeds into growing indebtedness because people are lacking resources in, in agricultural credit. The agriculturist gets very little credit. Agribusiness gets most of that credit. And you can see that from the size of the loans and which are the branches that are disbursing them urban metro branches are disbursing agricultural credit loans of 25 crores. Now, which peasant has that kind of, you know, resources to be able to take a 25 crore loan? So it's linked to that growing, growing inequality. Now, you take India, and there's been a slight dip this time after demonetization and stuff. Uh, the demonetization itself pointed you to many inequalities. Hmm? The big gainers are a handful of digital companies. They've gained unbelievable sums of money. Yeah, And these companies, these high-tech companies, with the huge gains they made, with the huge amount of uh, 
pre-tax and post-tax profits, then the top seven of them laid off 56,000 people in 2017. Okay? So you see, the entire claim of neoliberalism and conservative capitalism of you work hard, you will prosper. They laid off 56,000 people, mostly in the middle senior bracket, who were earning around 2 lakhs, every one of whom would have three AMIs, uh, ho ho home loan, uh, education loan for children abroad, uh, car loan, and at minimum three AMIs. And then you knock them out so that you can get in kids raw from the ITIs and elsewhere at 40,000 and 60,000 rupees. Now those people worked loyally and hard for their companies yeah, for 15 years or 20. You just knock them off. And I, I believe I read a thing by Mr. Narayan Murthy saying somewhere that this was all about uh, merit and performance. Now, your, it seems to me you have a singular lack of merit and performance in your leadership if it took you 15 years to find out that these people weren't performing. Yeah. So this, and now you look at the inequality if um, in just one year, 2017, Mr. Ambani added $16.9 billion to his total wealth of 23 billion, modest 23 billion he had, he added another 16.9 billion. That means adding $2 million an hour or something like that. Yeah, uh, it's just an absurd figure. That was 1,5,000 crores at the time. Imagine how hard he must have worked to you know, uh, earn, add 1,5,000 crores. Now, I asked myself, what happens if uh, an ordinary Indian, and who's an ordinary Indian? I will take a landless laborer as an ordinary Indian, wanted to earn that kind of money. Could he or she? I found you could. It'll take... 187,000 years working on the NREGS or it will take 18.7 million human beings working on the NREGS to do it in the same time frame of 12 months. Yeah. So that inequality has devastated everything and that inequality you know which is driven by conscious market fundamentalism to my mind, it's the recruiting agency for all the other fundamentalisms. You know, it destroys so many, it destroyed more millions of lives than any other single religious fundamentalism. And by the way, I think market fundamentalism is a very religious fundamentalism. You replace God with market and the rest of the doctrine stands. The invisible hand of the market, etc. Yeah. So like you said, this has been a process of the last 25 years, which has been progressively getting worse. Do you still see 2019 as more critical an election than any other? And if so, why? At some levels, yes. Yeah, because I think that see, what happened is that a lot of people angry and disgusted with the UPA, which, yeah, with you, which they had plenty of reason to be, threw them out saying anything is better. Right? I think we have spent the next five years finding out that anything is not better. Hmm. I think actually there are some differences. See, there are two things which have never happened before. And that makes it different. Uh, why are so many of the devastating things that happened in the last five years, how could they happen? Simply because, well, I think a starting or a central point is that for the first time in your history, you've had an RSS Pracharak as Prime Minister with a majority in Parliament. And by the way, I want to reiterate, I've said it a million times, I said it in 2014, They've, there was no mandate. There was a decisive electoral victory arising out of arithmetic. 31%, 69% voting against you is not a mandate. There was a decisive electoral victory. But it also brought to power 
the first time. Vajpayee had 24 people in his, 24 forces in his coalition that had some moderating effect. I'm, I'm not making a case for Vajpayee. I'm, I'm talking relatively. There were other forces operating on that. Now you have the unbridled you know, rule of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and its allied forces and clones and carbon copies. That I think is a gigantic landmark in uh, Indian electoral history. That is one. The second is that you are seeing, the you have seen in the last 15 years, but culminating in the last few, last 25 years, the building and structuring and now consolidation of the corporate state. The third thing, at the psychological level, and what makes the last five years unique, is that we've all, we've all, we're all familiar with the state as authoritarian. We yeah. went through the emergency. I think you're watching the consolidation of this. I mean, I think you're watching the emergence of the state as sociopath. That's what I think you're watching. Okay? I mean, the complete barbarization of discourse, the complete, your, uh, your attacks on anything constituting science, yeah? And the science establishment going on along with it, yeah, that the, the huge attacks on science, this, uh, the dismissal of Darwin or Newton, all of which, by the way, I don't question. I'm saying, I do not, I do not believe that anyone is about question. And Einstein would not have been Einstein if he had not worked on the principle that everything is, is, is within question. But what's happening is not a question based on inquiry. It's question based on fantasy. Yeah. And, and a very absurd dogma that, just see, there is no, uh, now a prime minister stands up at a health found, at a health, this thing, and talks about Karna and STEM engineering and uh, Ganesh and surgery, we knew it 50,000 years ago or whatever it was that he, how many ever years he said it was. There wasn't an editorial criticizing him for that. I cannot remember a mainstream corporate newspaper saying this is insane, which it was and is. A lesser person saying it, a Mahesh Sharma saying something stupid, there will be some mild, uh, criticism. mild criticism, even very, very diluted because they're afraid of their office being attacked or firebombed or whatever. So that's what I'm is it fear or is it complicit? Oh, it's both. Uh, one is, see, there are, there are, fear is a very, very um, huge element. It's, it's been there with everyone. See, I also don't want to say that everything that's happening with Modi started with Modi. That is not true. When I spoke in the JNU sit-ins, the sit-in teaching and thing, I, the, my first words to JNU were, after Kanaya was hauled away, and my first words were, welcome to the rest of India. So the other thing that's gone out of proportion is that new element, criminalization of dissent, very common in the countryside, yeah has reached the urban elites. That has happened. Okay? And they're not liking it, but many of them are very frightened. So fear is a very, very major factor. The other thing is, but there, are th there is also a huge degree of complicity, like say from corporate media. Hmm. I, as you know from the emergency, as we know from other situations, Fear in India is a huge factor, but there's a point at which frustration overrides fear as it did after the emergency and at other situations too. I don't I think that there are those who are very consciously 
And you can see that in so many of the TV stations and their channels and their anchors. They, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing is devastating. But they have a share in it. They have a, they're, they're, in, they're conniving with it. And above all, in the, uh, the corporate elite, you know, who have greater power in their hands than they ever did since the East India Company, perhaps, they see too much at stake to lose. Okay? They've made money hand over fist. They've made gigantic things. Now, uh, you know, coming back to, say, Mr. Ambani and his 16.9 billion. Yeah. Where did the money come from? I would think that it came from a few simple shifts in policy, like a policy that enabled GEO to nearly suffocate and strangulate all its rivals. It like began in Gujarat, actually, yeah. with the rise of the BJP and the state government, and you reliance there, reliance petrochemicals. E each year in the budget, if you look at the budget of Gujarat, there was a sufficient sales tax and other policies which would benefit that one sector. Yeah. And, and that's why the, that's why Reliance was a solid ally with the BJP in power. It goes back to a time when policies in imports were changed twice in 24 hours to benefit one company and then changed the policy within 24 hours so that others could not take benefit of that loophole. No? It, goes back, it goes back a while in our thing. So I think that there is a huge amount of complicity as well. And there is also, seriously, as I said, it's an alliance of fundamentalists. There is also the element, large element of shared values. All very three things. Huge, huge. I think, that, I, th I think the country has, in the last five years, something that was <laughs> happening earlier, I think has exploded. That is, this country is in the midst of an extremely serious social regression. Yeah. Just very quickly, your fantasy list, what should be the key areas for this election? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, as I said, first and foremost, they have become a managerial exercise. I would have wanted, I would have wanted to see that the opposition gets its act together. Yeah. And the entire, then the BJP strategy, Mr. Amit Shah's strategy, is based on leveraging buyouts, acquisitions, alliances, whatever, of every, even very small political parties, which can get them three seats somewhere in the Northeast, that sort of a thing. I don't see that that has happened. You know, maybe it's happened in Tamil Nadu. Yeah? You mean the opposition clear vision and agenda? Yeah. Okay. And say the alliance that has happened in UP, I'm very grateful for it. But I don't know that it has a common minimum program. At least not one which I'm aware of. Yeah? So I think that what they should have done and what the Congress did slightly and then failed to do, it won... Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, <coughs> Madhya Pradesh on the backs of agrarian and rural distress. My appeal to them and to, the, I would say, appeal to any government, BJP or anyone, I think every state has to set up. And I told them and I told those who won their victory, you're going to, if you think that a loan waiver cuts it, you are sorely mistaken. Hmm. I think every single state has to set up a permanent agrarian distress commission because that distress is growing. Or you call it agrarian welfare commission. It should be headed by the agriculture minister who is a the convener should be the agri minister who is a cabinet minister and therefore the board will not just be recommendatory, it will have some executive powers. You can get a top person from outside the state you want the prestige of getting someone to head it. It'll be like every state having a Swaminathan Commission with executive powers, yeah, with decision-making powers. And it won't just be about MSP and loans. So what will it be? 
you know one of the things that's happened in the last year and a half the great marches of farmers that have taken place nashik to mumbai it also saw and this is the positive side of it after 36 years in mumbai i saw the middle classes coming out and responding yeah. yeah there's been a little reality therapy from demonetization and gst and there's also been the fact that the farmers were able to reach out and touch the idealism of these middle classes i am i think out of that came a forum called the nation for farmers forum this is not a farmers forum it's a na- nation for farmers is middle classes and other classes concerned about the agrarian crisis and seeing how they can do something about it they played a role in mobilizing support for the march in delhi for the march second march in nashik the main thing that the nation for farmers has been repeatedly saying these are gigantic complex issues you need a 21 day minimum 3 week minimum special session of parliament to discuss the agrarian crisis and related issues now what are those issues msp and loan waiver are what we say in hindi pehla kadam the first steps yeah you've got to discuss the mega water crisis in this country i will also give it to you in writing so you can have 3 days for each i will also give it to you in writing you have no hope of resolving the agrarian crisis if you will not address and engage with the issues of mahila kisan dalit farmer and adivasi farmer now mahila kisans are those who do more than 60% of work in agriculture in this country but barely 8% of women own land in their own name if you cannot resolve the issues of this group and their role in agriculture is growing greater and greater as men migrate to other occupations or out of the village if you cannot engage with those who do 60% or more of the work in agriculture you will not resolve your crisis so you need the rights and entitlements of women farmers dalit farmers adivasi farmers and when i say adivasi farmers i don't just mean fra there are other issues involved i you need 3 days to discuss the credit crisis i'm saying that's much bigger than a loan waiver not only that the farmers should get their credit but why is agricultural credit going to non agriculturists why is the bu- and that is how they got into the indebtedness thing the shrinking of credit to the small farmer the total credit creeps growing but the share of the farmer has fallen dramatically 3 days on that you need 3 days to discuss what you know public investment in agriculture which has been horrible in the last 25 years that's one there's a brief period in upa 1 when there's a certain rise otherwise it's been terrible you need to discuss what kind of agriculture do we want in this country is it going to be corporate led or community led is it going to have um, you know are we going to have a chemical driven agriculture or are, an agro ecological based agriculture we going to have only cash crop or multi crop yeah so we also need to discuss well, the words are never spoken in parliament something called climate change yeah. which is very real yeah you need to discuss what is the state of the research institutions aligned to agriculture so i'm saying it's not just and you need so you need a bill of rights of and i think you have to look at the agrarian community as a whole not just at farmers yeah who officially defined are less than 8% of the population but there's this gigantic society that's why i've kept saying what we used to call the agrarian society agrarian crisis has gone way beyond the agrarian it's a societal crisis it's a a uh, civilizational crisis as the largest body of small holders and allied occupations fight for survival it's also a crisis of our own humanity that we could sit by and watch 3 lakh 10000 people commit suicide and do nothing and there has also been drop in male workforce unemployment all of that like the example you gave of the it company it's happening across the board media companies I just retrenching 400 300 200 people yeah. the same corporate media you're talking about yeah. so the new vote who comes in yeah. 
who has not voted in 2014, what does she or he look for? Every year you have 12 to 13 million people coming <clears throat> off employable age or working age. You know, they enter the job market. But the way, it not, it's not just Modi, but even under the Congress, mm. the way we define work, the way we define work participation. Women do most of the work, but their participation rate is dropping because you don't count unpaid work. Yeah, you don't count that. And there are other reasons. So I'm saying that, I think that what we co boast bragged about for 20 years, the demographic dividend, hmm, it is turning to be a nightmare. What is the dividend that those kids have got? That's one. And second is, 22 states in India have reached fertility replacement level. It will only go down from there. Okay? Which means that in 25, 30 years, if you like to think of not just the next election, but of your country and your children and your grandchildren, you will be a nation of senior citizens without health care because that's been privatized fully. So your gig there are gigantic issues. One is the inequality which reflects in health, education, hugely and employment in these three areas dramatically. Those are the gigantic issues which I hope people will vote on. And also we have to accept that even if people want to vote on them, sometimes they don't have the options. Right? They don't have options. Jim Hightower's book, The Senator from Texas, he had a book titled If the Gods Intended Us to Vote, They'd Have Given Us Candidates. That, 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 that problem that problem also comes up. So, he, pri, the unchecked privatization of health, education, and other public resources <coughs> is devastating the economy. It's devastating ordinary people. The, the you're going to have you're you're getting tens of millions of children condemned to a very low quality education with the destruction of public and government education. So that's that's something that's terrifying. I hope these are the issues on which people will look at and vote that. I think the idea of uh, criminalization of dissent, I think that's a very important thing for people to vote on. I think that many of these things come under that rubric of inequality. Finally, where will the left be? Left candidates, left presence in parliament? I don't know. I, I I don't know. I mean, you should ask them. I mean, you should ask those who represent them and speak to them. I don't see, I don't see, um, see the, say for instance, I don't see a left comeback in Bengal. I don't see that happening. It's, the polarization has become very communal. Yeah. It's, I've never seen Bengal in my lifetime. I've not visited a Bengal where it's so palpable. It makes you think of what 40s and 50s, 40s, late, far, late 40s <coughs> were. I think, that, I think that the left is in a very bad place in a very bad time. But uh, I think also that they can offer leadership to the farm protests. You know, you yeah, have... But for the left, you wouldn't have had those protests. You wouldn't have had those protests. Those were organized by the left. By They have, I mean, organizations which have 50 lakh members. Yeah. So I think that, I think that what you, what you have with the left is hope. Mm -hmm. You also have a man like Kanaya. <laughs> Who's, think, whose youth also, who's left also, I think, and, and, and who's been criminal, uh, whose descent has been criminalized. Yeah, and and who is most charismatic, yeah. very earthy in his connect. You have that. I still believe the left has the largest number of such people at the local level. I still believe that. But I'm saying the overall situation is one of uh, the largest parties have a kind of consensus on neoliberalism and that and those economics you know i think i think that the left has to go back to 
the farmers, the laborers to mass protest, to mass struggles. I think that's the way forward for the left and therefore for poorer people and marginalized societies as a whole. But I think they have a serious problem in this election, certainly. And I mean, who does it, <laughs> right? I, I think, I think by the way, that uh, the, I think the South is going to vote very differently from the North. Which was last time as well, because the 31% did not really represent the Southern vote it at all. It did not represent the Southern vote at all. And also what's happening is that I believe the only seats the BJP will win in the Southern Peninsula and possibly even in Goa and four union territories, I think almost all those eight seats or ten seats will be in Karnataka. Hmm? There is such a huge anti-NDA Modi sense that a, that a complete opportunist like Chandra Babu Naidu, who enjoyed nine and a half years of power with different regimes of the and of the of the BJP, saw that association with the BJP was going to cost him an election. By the way, I don't think he will win even now. But he came out and suddenly remembered that a demand for special status had not been met. Hmm. When other political parties had got their MPs to resign from parliament on that issue. KCR dissolved the assembly prematurely because he wanted the assembly and parliament elections to be separate because if they were together, the Modi connection was going to hurt him. That was going to hurt him. Everywhere, people have been trying hard to distance themselves from Modi, except for the ADMK, which its home secretary, its police commissioner are raided by enforcement directorate. It's uh, whatever secretary, chief secretary, chief one of yeah. uh, raided by the enforcement directorate. The ADMK has been bludgeoned into giving five seats to the uh, BJP. If I were the DMK, I'd be very happy that the ADMK gave the BJP five seats. You know, if you are the if you are the DMK, you would be happy because you're going to count those as sure seats in Tamil Nadu. Right? You're going to you're going to count that, and uh, I that mood, I think, is greater than it was in 2014. So eight, ten seats you know, from those, I'm not counting their allies. And I think that the gains they made in the Northeast are going to be significantly eroded after the NRC and citizenship bill. Yeah. And they will experience a drop, not the kind of drop that the Congress expects in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan. They will not experience the kind of drop that historical precedents would suggest but they're not going to get the same number of seats as the last time. And I think they will experience a significant drop in UP and perhaps a more significant drop in Bihar. So you're going to come back to, uh, you know, I think a non-majority single party situation where you say, let the games begin. Thank you so much. Thank Welcome. you very much.